It's time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Emmanuel Macron rose to power as France's youngest ever modern leader in 2017, beating radical right-wing candidate Marine Le Pen in the presidential election. Now, five years later, he appears to have done it again. According to exit polls, he's projected to secure his place in the Elysee for another term, a feat not seen since Jacques Chirac 20 years ago. But not everything is the same as 2017. Macron faces frustration and anger in French society with the impact of the pandemic and opposition against some of his economic policies. We discuss the outcome of the 2022 French election and what's ahead for Macron in his second term, if, of course, the projections are confirmed. Now, for this, we are joined by Cole Stangler, an independent journalist based in Paris, and Charlotte Cavaillé, assistant professor of public policy at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Very warm welcome to you both. And, well, let's start with you, Cole, now joining us from Paris. Uh, very late there, very exciting day. But, well, the French have seen the same result as 2017. You've got the same candidates, the same victor, it seems, but... What has changed from five years ago? Yeah, I mean, first off, th thanks for having me. There's there's a lot of different things that, that, that have changed here. I mean, I think I think for one, if you look at just the overall level of turnout, um, that that's something that's very striking initially here. Um, we have around 72% turnout right now, 99% of the results are in. So that's a pretty solid number to go by at this point. So 72% of people turned out to vote that's the lowest level that we've had uh, in, in a French presidential election since you have to go back to 1969, um, which was another election in which you didn't have the left wing in the second round between, that was between uh, Georges Pompidou and then uh, Pouer, a right wing, center right, center right candidate. So very low turnout, um, almost histor historic levels of, of, of low turnout, 72%. Beyond that, you also have a lot of people that actually went to the polls and uh, and cast what are known as blank or void ballots around nine percent. Uh, that's another another high number. You have millions of people that are voting and then casting protest ballots. So so I think if you look at the the, the turnout, that's the biggest change from from 2017. And then if you look also, I would say maybe quickly uh, the the Macron coalition. Um, that brought him to power in 2017 is different from from the coalition this time around. Um, you really saw that in the first round, um, but you see it also again in, in some of the, the exit polls that we're seeing. I'm looking at one study, although France doesn't formally conduct exit polls, they're, they're essentially uh, polls conducted of, of people who voted. Uh, you can see that the Macron base this time around, and we saw this a little bit in 2017, but this time it's, it's uh, even more wealthier than the average um, uh, French, uh, the, the average French voter, um, and also older than the average French voter. So you have this real shift in the Macron base, and you also have, you know, less less turnout. Those are two things that I think, are, just to begin, are, are pretty different from from 2017. Now, Charlotte, of course, as Cole just mentioned, um, the turnout was uh, it was uh, very important for both Macron and Le Pen. Of course, they're both very worried as the number of voters possibly abstaining could really make or break the election for them. So what did the turnout um, in the second round of the presidential election really indicate to you? Yeah, so there's two reasons, right? One is the left is not on the ballot. And when the left is not on the ballot, there's a whole political family missing. So, of course, few people turn out. And the other uh, feature is this. There's just less fear of uh, the far right winning. The cost of seeing the far right winning, if you, even if you don't support the far right, are perceived to be lower. And so why that is, um, you know, the several features. The far right, at least in this version, le Rassemblement National, has changed. The French have changed. And so how does that matter? So first of all, the party... The party of Marine Le Pen's father was um, xenophobic, anti-tax, anti-state party, kind of traditional far right. Marine Le Pen turned it into what political scientists call a welfare chauvinist party. It's a pro-social spending, uh, kind of pro-redistribution, uh, but only redistribution to native, to the French. So one of a um, of a kind of, you know signature uh, feature of a platform was to make sure that immigrants could not access social benefits, for instance. So in that sense, she has also pivoted to a discourse that emphasizing economic issues way more than her dad. And so when the party changes that way, we've seen that in many um, European countries, uh, numbers goes up. And the French also have changed. So 
Why was the far right scary historically in France? It's because it goes you know, all the way back to World War II and the Holocaust. Um, the far right has roots in um, you know, fat, fascist Nazi movements. That history, of course, is a long time gone for at least you know, younger, younger folks, but also younger folks are getting socialized into a very weak party system. They're not used to voting for strong traditional mainstream parties, and so they're less detached to traditional parties, don't, know, don't carry the, the burden of the traditional far right, and thus are less likely um, to vote for the far right, to, to resist the far right, or to be scared of it. So these are the two main ways to think about why uh, we ended up with that low turnout, which again is much higher than the US, so I'm a little jealous to be honest, <laughs> 72%. And well cool, actually this election it appeared to be something of an unpopularity contest that was seen as a referendum on Macron and well now he's clearly won and well what do you think the French public want or simply expect to see from him? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's important to, to note, uh, as even, even uh, the president uh, himself noted in, in his, his victory speech, which, which was a little bit more subdued than, than, than last time, um, is that he's getting a, a lot of support from, from people who don't necessarily agree with his platform. And I think if you want, I mean, to go back to, in some ways, you know, you might call it sort of the original sin of, of, uh, of Macronism, um, the, the struggles that he's had over, over five years despite being reelected, um, was the fact that in 2017, when he won with this really big mandate, um, sort of, I should say with a big margin of victory over Marine Le Pen, you know, 30 plus points, which is much smaller this time. But in any case, when he had this, this big victory over Le Pen, um, Macron interpreted that, or at least um, governed as if that was a mandate for his um, you know, fairly specific set of, of, of policy proposals um, and a very, which is a very, um, you know, very pro-business, um, center-right um, political agenda, uh, including a lot of, of neoliberal economic reforms, um, you know, cutting taxes uh, on the rich, uh, reforming labor law, etc. So Macron governed uh, over the last five years um, as if, you know, he had this mass mandate when in fact you had a lot of people voting for him to um, defeat the far right. And so what will be interesting to see um, is in this new mandate that, that, that's starting now, this new term, excuse me, over the next five years, uh, is Macron going to take into account the fact that, um, you know, of these millions of people who voted for him, you have a big chunk of people that are not buying into his, his policy program that has essentially voted for him to deny power to the far right. And it was interesting if you looked at his speech uh, tonight, you know, he did reference um, the millions of people who didn't vote. And he also referenced the fact that you had millions of people who voted for him in order to block the far right um, from taking power. So he explicitly acknowledged them in terms that, that were more, uh, that were stronger than, than in 2017. Um, but of course, you know, uh, Macron gives lots of speeches. People are used to this at this point. The question is, are we going to see actual policies to reflect the fact that um, you know, in order to govern, he, he, you know, he might have to perhaps rely on, on, on a chunk of voters that, that are more left leaning, um, which is not at all really how he, how he governed over the first five years. Um, and again, we'll have to see, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, he, he's made a few uh, very concrete policy proposals uh, in the campaign, um, notably raising the retirement age, um, also reforming a, a popular welfare program. Those aren't exactly left wing proposals uh, by any stretch, but he's also said he wants to have a prime minister in charge of ecological planning, environmental planning. That could be maybe a, a shift a little bit to the left. But again, I think that the question here, the, really the fundamental question for, for Macron is, is he going to uh, shift uh, these next five years to reflect the fact that you have, you know, his, his coalition is, is maybe not as strong as it looks on paper. If you look at that margin, that, that 16 points, that it's, it's a, you know, in some ways more fragile than that. And Charlotte, I wonder what you make of this. Of course, Macron was a newcomer five years ago, but now he's very much the establishment. There was growing dissatisfaction with what some saw as a failure to deliver key reforms, uh, not to mention protests against his policies from both the left and right sides of the political spectrum. And he's seen as privileged and arrogant by some. So what is he really going to have to do differently this time around? How is he going to reach out to those voters who thought he should go? Yeah, so Macron is also a political beast, right? So he will go uh, where he has to go. And so the next um, two months is going to be really fascinating because 
The, so the France has a, what we call a sem semi-presidential system. So Macron is elected. He's, he's good. He's got his job for the next five years. But he cannot run a government that doesn't have the support of the parliament. And the legislative elections are not going to be concluded until the late end of June. So that leaves two months for people to get organized. And so right now, it's really hard to predict where he's going to go because he doesn't really know what coalition he's going to have to build in order to have a stable government. And he's even going to be able to do that. And so when you look at the first round of the presidential election, you have a left-wing bloc. And let's say it's a third, a third, a third, a left-wing bloc. But, you know, I call Macron a technocratic <laughs> bloc. And then the bloc identitaire, the more kind of exclusionary, xenophobic right-wing right bloc. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting. You know the three-body problem, the science fiction uh, book? I think about it that way. With the current uh, political system um, in France, three blocks is extremely unstable. This is not the way you, you have a stable uh, um, government that can actually implement reforms. And so for me, when I'm thinking about Macron right now, I'm thinking about the next two months, how uncertain uh, the situation is. When he knows what's in there, he's very pragmatic. It's going to be interesting to see him potentially shift further to the left or even further to the right to some extent. We'll see. But until we have the results of the legislative elections, this is, uh, this is you know, tea leaf. <laughs> and speaking of the uh, legislative uh, election coming up in about six weeks, call now, um, radical left-wing leader uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, he's emerged as a surprise kingmaker in this election, capturing over 22% of the vote in the election's first round earlier this month. And now he's calling on his voters to make him prime minister. So do you think um, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon and his supporters, they're going to play a bigger role in French politics going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to see, you know, as, as Charlotte mentioned, how these legislative elections pan out. What is interesting to note is that, you know, covering French politics here for the last few years, last several years, you know, for for, for five years under Macron, uh, there was, you know, a lot of tensions between these various left-wing parties from La France Insoumise, which is Mélenchon's party, to the Communists, to the Greens, um, to the Socialists, to even, you know, other smaller far-left parties. Um, a lot of tension between these parties. And, you know, constantly criticizing one another, trying to out angle, you know, out maneuver one another. And what's happened really over the last two weeks since the first round of, of the presidential elections, where you mentioned Jean-Luc Mélenchon's high score, he really emerged as this kingmaker. And what's been remarkable to watch is these parties are now uh, in pretty serious negotiations to have a legislative coalition that would be able to, um, you know, present candidates a united block of candidates in um, in those legislative elections in June. Now, I should say those, those they're not completed, but these talks are ongoing. And from what people are telling me and what you what you can find in the press as well is they're advancing. And and again, Mélenchon in theory would be would be uh, the prime minister of, of this coalition. At least he's he's promising that as a way to, to perhaps to mobilize people to to vote for him because Mélenchon did you know get a lot of support in, in important um, uh, working class. Uh, blocks of of, of 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 that the left needs to to carry in order to in order to be able to govern. So um, things are, are moving in that direction. And then the other you know sort of big question that's hanging over this is what you know what are the parameters of this left coalition going to look like? Is it going to be just La France Insoumise, the Communists, and the Greens, and maybe another far left party, or is it also going to in include the Socialist Party? Um, the Socialists. And La France Insoumise have been rivals for, for quite some time. Mélenchon himself is a former socialist. They don't particularly like each other. Um, but perhaps they're willing to set that aside for, you know, with the, the prize of having a, this legislative majority. So it's too soon to say. But um, again, as Charlotte was saying, you have these three blocks. And, 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 you know, I think a lot of one thing we know about French politics today is things are certainly very volatile. And Charlotte, your thoughts on this. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, what do you think is ahead for Le Pen and her voters? Oh, it's fascinating. So the, the far right loves division. They really have a hard time kind of coordinating between the Marine Le Pen wing, more pragmatic, who's moved towards this welfare chauvinist platform, and then the kind of traditional conservative, very xenophobic wing that's embodied by her niece and um, Zemmour, uh, who created its, its own party in the process. 
And so it's going to be really interesting if they manage to overcome their differences and actually build a voting bloc, because then they actually have a chance to be the opposition uh, in parliament, which if they don't do that, they won't have a chance. And Zimmer's speech was actually, um, that he just gave after uh, the results, was kind of captured that really well. What is interesting with Marine Le Pen is she's, she's, she's contradicting herself to some extent, because she's managed to build a party, all right, compared to her dad. The party before, before her with her dad was this personality called Jean-Marie Le, uh, Jean Le Pen. And with her, it's a real party with local notables who are elected in local elections. Well, the way a party works, if you lose elections, you let somebody else take your spot. That's how a party works. It's a machine to create leaders. But she's not stepping down. <laughs> so there's still this tension on the right between this personalization of power and the slow success in building a real party that's attracting voters. And how they solve that um, is going to decide of their fate for the next five years. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but that was Paul Stangler and Charlotte Cavalier. Thank you both so much for your insights today. Thanks for having us. Thank you.